Now I'm going to talk today about the relationship between Leonardo's anatomical studies and his paintings, in particular the Saint Jerome. I gave a first draft of this paper at a conference in London uh, in 2012 in connection with the exhibition then at the National Gallery. Now three years ago I was concerned that my proposals may be too speculative um, and not supported by the available evidence. But since then, close analyses of other technical investigations, such as that of the St. Anne, that Bruno and Cinzia have presented at this conference, have persuaded me that my reconstruction is in fact not at all exceptional in Leonardo's work. Now the study of anatomy was arguably the most significant of all of Leonardo's many scientific pursuits but it occupied only two relatively short periods of his career. A first burst in the late 1480s, and then about six years of sustained investigation uh, between about 1507 and 1513. And the reasonable supposition that this work was intimately related to his practice as a painter is in fact less demonstrable than one might expect. His anatomical studies were initially prompted at a practical level by his aim to compile a treatise on the theoretical basis of painting. That treatise would equip an artist to produce what might be termed scientific paintings that were true to nature in every respect. Of necessity, it had to take in every aspect of the appearance of the physical world, including, of course, the principal subject matter of the Renaissance artist, the human body. No later than 1489, Leonardo had conceived the idea of developing a separate treatise on the human body. The well-known early outline of that treatise, written in that year, 1489, sets out his intention to cover not just anatomy and physiology, but also the phenomena of life, reproduction and birth, growth, the emotions and the senses. Other than anatomy and physiology, Leonardo was unable to get very far with these subjects at any stage of his investigations. The phenomena of life largely resist analysis, certainly with the investigative tools available to Leonardo. Nonetheless, the fact that he was quite rapidly able to bring his understanding of those topics up to the academic standards of his day demonstrates that he was not working in a vacuum. While in his notes, we sometimes find him rather defensive, dismissing book learning and proclaiming himself a disciple of experience, he was well aware of current anatomical literature and most probably of contemporary discourse. Though Leonardo's working knowledge of Latin was probably rudimentary, the book lists compiled on several occasions during his life include quite a number of works in that language. In the field of anatomy, foremost among these was the 1491 edition of Johannes de Ketem's Fasciculus, which incorporated Mondino's Anatomia, still the most comprehensive anatomical text available around 1500. But in Leonardo's notes, he very rarely quotes from such sources verbatim. He occasionally mentions the name of a forerunner, such as Avicenna or Mondino, both of whom are mentioned by name on this sheet of around 1510. But usually, Leonardo paraphrases or simply renders the information entirely in his own words. It's very difficult, therefore, to identify at any one moment exactly which anatomical textbooks he was working from. Even harder to pin down, because there is rarely any evidence, are the conversations that Leonardo must have had with other practicing anatomists throughout his career. All his early biographers testify to Leonardo's charming and gregarious nature, and throughout his scientific investigations, he must have been eager to learn from every available authority. We know the identities of a few of these figures, such as Luca Pacioli or Marc Antonio della Torre, but we will never be able to reconstruct with any precision this aspect of Leonardo's intellectual life. But it is indicative of Leonardo's full awareness of contemporary anatomical discourse that right from the start of his researches, he attempted to come to terms with the most challenging of subject matter, 
The central theme of his early anatomical research was the role of the nervous system in the phenomena of life. This informal sheet takes monkeys, dogs, pigs, and frogs as its subjects. The drawings of the upper limb concentrate on the nerve pathways, and the note records an experiment in which Leonardo pierced the spinal cord of a frog that had been decapitated and yet retained a semblance of life. Now such an experiment is, one might think, a world away from the requirements of a 15th century painter. But in Leonardo's understanding, it was highly relevant. As a painter, he wanted to know how the workings of the mind were manifested in the outward forms of the body, how impulses formed in the mind traveled outwards along the nerves to determine the configurations of the bones and muscles. And as a scientist, it was crucial to know how the physical nature of the universe was perceived by the mind. In other words, how information was received by the senses and transmitted to the brain for processing. Both considerations required Leonardo to understand the structure of the brain and its connections with the body and thus the world via the nerves. But he struggled, understandably, to find any concrete basis for these speculations. The distribution of the mental faculties, the action of the nerves, and the way in which these were linked to the transient forms of the body, these all eluded him. In the outline for the treatise that I mentioned earlier, Leonardo wished to examine the four universal conditions of man, what we would now term the emotions. But there is no systematic treatment of these mental states anywhere in Leonardo's surviving notes. Instead, we find the movements of the soul treated most satisfactorily in his paintings. It's become a trope of descriptions of the Ambrosiana musician, for example, or Cecilia Gallarani, that Leonardo succeeded in depicting an individual with an inner life and mobile emotions. And the common theme of all accounts of the Last Supper is how well Leonardo succeeded in capturing the emotions of the protagonists through their expressions and gestures. But it cannot be argued that these successes were a result of Leonardo's anatomical work of the previous decade. He achieved these effects instinctively, not through scientific study. And in The Last Supper, there is nothing that could not be ascertained by superficial examination. Judas's guilty shock is conveyed by the tension of his neck muscles. One might wish to cite Leonardo's evident knowledge of the deeper structures, but the only muscle that can be identified with some certainty, called sternocleidomastoid, which is this muscle, sorry, there, is very poorly shown in this drawing. Now I suspect that Leonardo must have been frustrated by how little benefit his early anatomical researches actually brought him. Even his early studies of proportion, a major element of Leonardo's anatomical work around 1490, and of obvious potential use to an artist, found little or no place in Leonardo's practice as a painter. In attempting to determine the ideal proportions of man, Leonardo's observations became ever more detailed and less and less relevant to the concerns either of a painter or of an anatomist. Ironically, Leonardo's most famous drawing, The Vitruvian Man, is both untypical of Leonardo in its willing reliance on ancient authority and represents a dead end in his investigations of the human form. The more Leonardo investigated human proportion, the further away a formula for ideal beauty seemed, and his proportional studies faded away. Between the early 1490s and around 1505, Leonardo seems to have conducted no significant anatomical study. The revival of his interest seems to have been prompted, at least in part, by the commission of 1503 to paint the huge mural of the Battle of Anghiari. This was perhaps the most prestigious commission of Leonardo's career, and also the most dynamic composition that he ever worked on. The size of the painting, some 20 meters wide, required Leonardo to prepare the composition meticulously, and he returned to the study of anatomy after a gap of more than 10 years. His investigations were now led by their immediate practical purpose towards a painting rather than a treatise. Initially, he concentrated on the topics that would be of immediate use, such as the expressions of fury in man and horse and the superficial musculature of man. 
But as so often in Leonardo's scientific career, his urge to discover fundamental causes soon drew him back to the study of human anatomy, independently of the specific requirements of the Battle of Anghiari. He did not entirely neglect his early interest in the phenomena of life, but he was now primarily concerned with the physical structure of the body. Now, following Leonardo's anatomical career at this time is difficult due to the lack of datable works and the wide range of his studies, including both human and animal dissections, often presented as a conflation of the two. His regular access to human material is evidenced by his celebrated description of the death and dissection of an old man in the hospital of Santa Maria Nuova in Florence in the winter of 1507-8. to A passing reference to the other dissection of a child of two years and the clarity with which he identified the cause of death in the old man both suggest that human dissection was now almost routine for Leonardo. A year or two later he stated, I have dissected more than 10 human bodies, and it's plain by this stage in his career, Leonardo had sufficient reputation as an anatomist to be permitted to conduct dissections as a matter of course. Now the treatise on anatomy was still very much in Leonardo's mind in these years. A revised outline of the projected treatise emphasizes the shift in his interests, however. The earlier focus on the phenomena of life was replaced by an overriding concern with the physical, what we would recognize today as a treatise on anatomy. Now, Paolo Giovio stated that Leonardo conducted dissections in medical schools, and Vasari names one of his collaborators, Marc Antonio della Torre, then professor of anatomy at the University of Pavia. It seems that this collaboration took place in the winter of 1510 and resulted in the drawings of the so-called Anatomical Manuscript A. This collaboration with a professional anatomist gave Leonardo a ready supply of human material, and the number of corpses that he claimed to have dissected grows from more than 10, around 1509, to more than 30 towards the end of his life, a figure that is not contradicted by the surviving drawings. To complement this, Leonardo's collaboration with a professional led him to attain a balance between detail and coverage. The pattern of almost all of Leonardo's scientific studies throughout his life was to drown in detail, but the presence of Marc Antonio at Leonardo's shoulder, so to speak, encouraged Leonardo to see the bigger picture. The campaign of the winter of 1510 is the only period in Leonardo's whole anatomical career that he managed to survey most of the body to a consistent level of detail. He illustrated every bone in the body except those of the skull and most of the major muscle groups. Through the medium of a skilled engraver, these drawings would have served magnificently as plates to a published treatise. But this clear understanding of what might be achievable in a treatise had led Leonardo away from a sense of how that knowledge might be applied to the practice of a painter. From this period dates the greatest of Leonardo's anatomical researches, but also, to a large degree, the separation of his anatomical researches from his artistic practice. In 1511, Marc Antonio della Torre died. Leonardo lost both his access to human material and the balance between coverage and detail in his anatomical studies. For the last two years of his anatomical career, Leonardo had to rely on animal material and focused on a small number of detailed topics, embryology, the rib cage and diaphragm, the wing of the bird, and most notably the functioning of the heart. In September 1513, Leonardo and his assistants left Lombardy for Rome. Leonardo seems to have attempted to continue his anatomical researches at the hospital of Santo Spirito, but in a draft letter he complains of having been hindered in anatomy, denounced before the Pope and likewise at the hospital by the jealous German mirror maker Giovanni degli Specchi. Leonardo's anatomical work seems to have ground to a halt, and there's no evidence that he carried out any further work or even revisited his earlier notes before his death in France in 1519. Now, only rarely have I mentioned specific paintings during this talk, and indeed it's remarkable that as Leonardo's understanding of the human form increased in sophistication, so the anatomical content of his paintings dropped away.
There is apparently nothing in the late painting of the Baptist that speaks of even the most passing acquaintance with the structures under the skin. The same could be said of the St. Anne, or the Mona Lisa, or the Leda. But I'd like to propose that Leonardo's later anatomical work found its outlet in the most anatomical of his paintings. The St. Jerome has, in the past, usually been dated to the early 1480s, primarily on its superficial resemblance in its unfinished state to the Uffizi Adoration. More recently, the redating of this painting to the end of the 1480s has been argued, and in the present exhibition, the rough date range 1485 to 90 is proposed. As Larry showed this morning, the kneeling pose with one arm outstretched is a recurring motif in Leonardo's career. This early study of around 1480 shows the body, legs, and left arm of the kneeling Madonna, much as in the Saint Jerome, but turned through 90 degrees. The small metal point study, seen here in ultraviolet light, shows the arm outstretched, but the Madonna on both knees, which is, of course, her pose in the Virgin of the Rocks. In the first underdrawing on the panel, later reused for the London version of the Virgin of the Rocks, we see a composition unquestionably close to the St. Jerome. And this drawing, by a Milanese associate of Leonardo, agrees almost exactly with the pose of the St. Jerome, but turned through 180 degrees, which might suggest that a small three-dimensional model in this pose was known in Leonardo's circle around 1490. The woodcut frontispiece to the Antiqua Antiquaria Prospettica Romane, published around 1500, though not an exact rendering of this type, suggests a wider dissemination of this very ambitious pose in Milan. And Leonardo continued to consider the spatial challenge of this pose later in his career. His first drawings for later, probably drawn around 1505, are essentially studies in the depiction of a figure balancing on one knee with the arm outstretched. But more profoundly than this long-running formal concern, Leonardo's desire to relate the movements of the body to the movements of, its, of the mind was at its height in his work of around 1490. The St. Jerome is the only painting in which the whole body is the vehicle of emotion, rather than primarily the head and the hands. And as a highly stressed male nude, it is legitimate, I think, to analyze the anatomical details of the painting as we see it today. The connection between the St. Jerome and Leonardo's anatomical interests has often been noted, but to my knowledge, the specific anatomical content has never been interrogated. The outstretched arm of the saint does have physical similarities to this drawing of the 1480s, but these are, I believe, largely generic. More precise comparisons may be made with sheets from the anatomical manuscript day of 1510, which demonstrate that every contour in the current outline of the St. Jerome's arm corresponds precisely to an identifiable muscle. Within the outlines of the arm, however, Leonardo indicated few anatomical details. The most fully worked up area is the shoulder, chest, neck, and head, and three muscles in particular are highlighted. Um, deltoid, over the top of the shoulder, pectoralis major from the chest to the arm, and sternocleidomastoid from the collarbone up the side of the neck. I must apologize for the use of these technical terms, but there really is no alternative. Now each of these muscles has an individual career, so to speak, within Leonardo's anatomical investigations. Sternocleidomastoid, as its name indicates, has two origins on the clavicle and the sternum, and an insertion on the mastoid process of the cranium up there. Leonardo depicted the muscle repeatedly during both his anatomical campaigns, and in the first, he usually got it wrong. To take two examples from the earlier part of his career, in this sheet of the mid to late 1480s, it's shown as a single muscle running downwards from the mastoid process to an undefined point at the front of the thorax. On this study, maybe two or three years later, it's broadly correct, but confused by a number of deeper elements running from the clavicle forwards towards the jaw. And in the study of Judas, which I mentioned earlier, sternocleidomastoid is shown as two distinct elements curving away from one another, one there and one down there. Mm. But the whole area is very confused in this drawing of around 1495. 
In Leonardo's drawings of around 1510, however, he consistently shows the muscle correctly, as you see in these details, and as in the Saint Jerome. Uh, on both sides of Saint Jerome's neck, you can see the other muscle with the two origins there and there. Now, the second deeper muscle at the neck of St. Jerome, this one running here under the jaw, is omohyoid, which is again studied repeatedly in Leonardo's anatomical work of 1510, and you can see it very clearly indicated in that drawing there. Now, the other two muscles highlighted in the St. Jerome, deltoid and pectoralis major, were in Leonardo's drawings of around 1510, usually divided into distinct portions, just to go back here. As you can see again in these two details, deltoid is routinely split, not along its line of action, but transversely or obliquely through its middle. You can see the split there and again there. And that's exactly the form that we see in the St. Jerome, this strange little depression along the outline of the shoulder and this very clearly indicated pit right there. This is not an accidental feature of the painting, but a very deliberate decision on Leonardo's part. As for pectoralis major, its division into separated portions is not completely fanciful. The muscle does have a broad range of origins, from the clavicle down the sternum to the lower ribs, and a range of insertions on the humerus. But what's strange is that the upper portions from the clavicle attach lower down the humerus, the lower portions attach higher up the humerus in a complex three-dimensional twist. Only in very emaciated individuals do these portions appear as distinctly as Leonardo habitually shows them, and they're never completely separate. But if we understand Leonardo's drawings as diagrammatic, then he captures the fundamental form and action of this muscle very astutely. He shows this arrangement repeatedly in the drawings of around 1510, very precisely in the Saint Jerome, and nowhere else in the whole of his drawn or painted work. One may also observe that Sternocleidomastoid and pectoralis major are attached on the clavicle in two equal and opposed points, which was a general principle stated by Leonardo in his anatomical notes of around 1510. Finally, to the head of the saint. Now, I can see the attraction in dating the Saint Jerome close to the skull studies of 1489, for there is a strong sense of the underlying bone in the painting. A couple of Leonardo's early anatomical drawings do try to depict some of the soft tissues of the face, but this is a very difficult area to dissect, and those drawings are rudimentary and generally inaccurate. But what we see in the Saint Jerome is a profound and highly accurate understanding of the muscles of the face, and he arrived at that understanding only following the dissections of 1510. He's particularly emphasized the muscle in the cheek, known as zygomaticus major, and I show the relevant plate from Gray's Anatomy here to show you exactly which one I mean in the painting. It's this structure running down there. Mm -hmm. Now, a true understanding of this area, as seen in the St. Jerome, cannot be obtained through surface inspection. It requires a skilled and sensitive dissection, and Leonardo achieved that only in his work of 1510. So to sum up, the sophisticated and precise anatomical content that we see in the St. Jerome is simply not found in Leonardo's early studies, but is copiously present in his late work. On this evidence, the panel in its present form cannot date solely from as early as 1490. So the painting seems to be an amalgam of interests that were prominent in two different periods of Leonardo's career. The pose of the figure and the interest in the movements of the mind are indicative of a work of around 1490. The anatomical details in the figure were known to Leonardo only around 1510. I wish to propose, therefore, that the painting was executed in two distinct phases. Now, Leonardo's method of constructing the St. Jerome is partly visible by direct examination of the panel and partly by infrared reflectography. The infrared in particular demonstrates that there are at least two stages of drawing on the gesso ground, then a translucent white imprimatura, then further drawing with the brush over the imprimatura and areas of modeling in both translucent washes and two distinct layers of brown paint. The areas that demonstrate later anatomical knowledge are executed in a technique that is distinct from the rest of the panel. The outlines of the arm and shoulder are silhouetted in a much darker, almost opaque brown paint, 
The areas of the shoulder, chest and head are modelled with a subtlety that is not required at this stage of the underpaint. In places some lead white is added, giving the impression of a grisaille painting rather than a blocked out composition. And it may be observed that the precise anatomical structures that I've discussed are not seen in the initial outline drawing. Now these infrared images, I should add, were made about 10 years ago, and I'm sure they could be improved with the technology now available. But to take the neck, for example, the initial outlines show a mixture of lines passing up from the clavicle, including lines of trapezius passing up here towards the back of the neck. And instead of the clear passage of homohyoid up there to the jaw, just these loose lines which indicate sagging skin hanging underneath the jaw of an old man. Only in the subsequent dark brown modeling is this confusion resolved and the muscles correctly and clearly shown. Looking again at deltoid, the outline of the shoulder is smooth and continuous in the underdrawing. I think you can see it there. Only when Leonardo came to elaborate the image with dark brown modeling did he add the odd and highly distinctive division of the muscle that I mentioned earlier. And the pentimento in the outline of the shoulder is very clearly visible to the naked eye. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there's no infrared image available of the chest area at present, but the little that one can see on this scan shows no evidence of the clavicular portion of pectoralis major that is so prominently indicated in the panel, which should be just coming out along there. Now, it's impossible to tell through technical investigation how long may have elapsed between the successive stages of underdrawing and modelling, but it's my contention that, that significant passages of the modelling of St. Jerome were added 20 years after his first outlining of the figure, and that the modeling incorporates the anatomical discoveries that Leonardo had made during his dissections of the winter of 1510. Now, the early history of the St. Jerome is entirely unknown. By 1510, the initial project of the late 1480s, whatever that was, had presumably lapsed, and the panel may have been no more than an outlined and blocked-in composition languishing in Leonardo's Milanese workshop. It may therefore have presented itself as an opportunity for Leonardo to try out his new anatomical understanding in the context of a painting, at a time when his painted figures in general were becoming increasingly incorporeal and unworldly. The changes to the Saint Jerome aren't transformative and they don't affect the overall tenor of the work, but they do show how Leonardo could use his hard-won anatomical knowledge to give a greater precision and thus a more compelling sense of presence to a devotional painting. Now my last hypothesis, very short, is much more speculative, perhaps to the point of irresponsibility. The chronology that I've proposed dates the Saint Jerome to the two periods of activity, the 1480s and around 1510, that coincide with Leonardo's two periods of anatomical investigation. Could it be that this painting the most anatomical of his career, was conceived of in a specifically anatomical context. The dissections of 1510 were carried out, most probably at the University of Pavia, in collaboration with Marc Antonio della Torre. But Marc Antonio's father, Girolamo della Torre, who died in 1506, had also been a prominent anatomist. I noted earlier that we often have no knowledge of the identity of Leonardo's scientific contents, nor of the circumstances under which they collaborated. Girolamo della Torre spent most of his career in Padova and Ferrara, with a spell in the early 1480s in Pisa, and there's no evidence to connect him to Leonardo. But he was perhaps the sort of figure who might have commissioned a devotional painting of his name saint, San Girolamo, in which Leonardo demonstrated the spiritual potential of the physical body. Little was done in the 1480s, but 20 years later, when working with Girolamo's son, Marc Antonio, Leonardo returned to the panel and as no more than an exercise added the muscular structures that he'd just discovered. Now if this reconstruction of the chronology of St. Jerome is even partly correct, the painting would be one of the few artistic manifestations of Leonardo's anatomical work and perhaps the most explicit example of scientific painting in the whole of Leonardo's career. Clearly, Leonardo's scientific studies often have a sci uh, an aesthetic sensibility. Clearly, his paintings attempt to embody scientifically observed effects. But the relationship between the two is not, in practice, 
as intimate as one might expect, and only for a short period of Leonardo's career did his artistic and his anatomical aims coincide. Thank you.